Thank you all for joining us. We'll get started in just a few minutes. We're going to allow everyone to enter the room first. All right, looks like our numbers continue to climb a little bit, but we're gonna go ahead and do some of the front part of this and hope our numbers level off by the time we hit our presenters. Thank you all for joining us today for the National Center for Rural Road Safety's May 2023 webinar, SS4A, What Rural Should Know. My name is Jamie Sullivan and I'm the director for the National Center for Rural Road Safety. We have a few webinar logistics for you. Um, as always, our duration for today is about an hour and a half. Closed captioning is available and was sent out earlier today. You can also find the link um, available in the chat pod uh, should you have not received it earlier. The recording for the webinar will be available in about a week on our webinar archive page, which you can find under the ruralsafetycenter.org's training dropdown. Today we will be using our question and answer pod. Please go ahead and put those questions for our presenters in there at any time. And when we do stop at the question period, which we'll have three of today, I will read those out to our, um, to our trainers. You can also use that question and answer pod to alert uh, the organizers of any technical difficulties you may be having so that we can go ahead and take care of those as well. We do have a handout or a PDF of today's slides available in the handout pod that you can download. This will be very useful to you um, in order to be able to get some of the links that we'll be sending. I will also put those in the chat pod um, as our trainers are going along as well. But again, that handout will have all of the slides for today's webinar. We will have a survey that will come um, pop up at the end of the webinar and will also be emailed out tomorrow. We'd ask if you wouldn't mind filling that out it helps us understand um, how useful these webinars are and there's a question in there for you to let us know what additional topics you'd like us to cover in our webinars for the year and we will be offering certificates of completion for today's webinar as well as uh, providing those people with the uh, forms to fill out for continuing education units as well so look in your emails those emails will come out in um, several weeks from our events at ruralsafetycenter.org email address. Today we have three presenters who are joining us. We have Elliot Moore from FHWA's Resource Center, Adam Kirk from the Kentucky LTAP, and Kevin Elliott also from the National Center for Rural Road Safety. The goal of our webinar today is for you to have an understanding of the next round of the US DOT's Safe Streets and Roads for All Notice of Funding Opportunity. Our learning outcomes that we'll go through are to list the requirements for this round of the SS4A Notice of Funding Opportunity, to identify the differences from the first round, to list lessons learned by Kentucky LTAP when they applied through the first round of this um, program, and then to identify some resources for developing action plans. Our first speaker that we're going to have um, is Elliot Moore. He's a senior safety engineer with the FHWA Resource Center. Elliot is in a hybrid position that collaborates closely between the Resource Center and the Office of Safety on efforts that advance the goal of getting to zero fatalities and serious injury crashes on the nation's roadways. He specializes in intersection and interchange design. 
preventing roadway departure fatalities, and is providing technical assistance on the Safe Streets and Roads for All initiative, often referred to as ss for a Elliot Cur currently resides in Richmond, Virginia with his wife, two ch small children, and their recently adopted puppy. And we're really excited to have um, Elliot share with us today more about the new ss for a call for proposals. Elliot? All right, can everybody hear me okay? We can. Okay, and then can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. All right, thanks. Um, you know, first off, I just want to say thanks for this opportunity to present today. Um, I'm seeing 254 attendees so far, and I'm sure we'll have more trickle in, and I'm sure there's even more registered that can come back and watch this recording later. So it goes to show you the amount of interest that's in this topic. Um, so let's just talk about the uh, Safe Streets and Roads for All discretionary program. Uh, if you haven't heard, it's a program that's going to provide about five to six billion dollars in grants over the next few years. Uh, it was established by the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, under this uh, funding, it supports regional, local, and tribal initiatives through grants to prevent roadway deaths and serious injury. So my goal today is that I can provide an overview of the requirements of this new round of funding and discuss some of the similarities and differences uh, from last round uh, if you were uh, to have gone after some of those different grants. So since we are in the NOFO period currently, I have to provide uh, the following disclaimer. Um, so except for any statutes or regulations cited, the contents of this presentation do not have the force and effect of law and are not meant to bind the public in any way. This presentation is intended only to provide information regarding existing requirements under the law uh, or agency policies. So now that we have that non-fun stuff out of the way, uh, let's get into the meat of this. So as most of you know, the past few years, we've seen a very troubling increase in roadway fatalities. In 2021, we recorded 42,915 deaths on our roadways. That could be 42,915 friends or family members, or even some of the colleagues that you work with today. Um, hopefully all of you are in agreement that this is completely unacceptable. So programs like the Safe Streets and Roads for All are some of the ways that the U.S. Department of Transportation is addressing what the Secretary has called a crisis on our roadways. So to address the roadway safety crisis, uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation launched the National Road Safe Roadway Safety uh, Strategy. It's called the NRSS uh, back in January of 22. And it has a few key elements. The first is that the NRSS sets a vision of zero lives lost on our roadways. Now notice that we said zero lives lost on the roadways and not zero crashes. There's a big distinction between the two. It also articulates and prioritizes actions that can be completed in the next few years that will significantly reduce the fatalities and serious injuries. It adopts the safe system approach as our guiding principle to support our safety actions. And finally, it recognizes that we can't do it alone. We need everyone, especially people on this call, which could be from all levels of government, law enforcement, industry, nonprofit and advocacy organization, researchers and beyond to do their part to help implement the safe system approach to make our streets safer for people. So the US DOT adopts the safe system approach. Hopefully most of you have heard of this, um, but if you haven't, uh, it is essentially gonna be our guiding paradigm to address roadway safety going forward. Um, this differs significantly from some of the conventional safety approaches that we've had in the past by acknowledging that both um, humans make mistakes and that they are vulnerable and that the designs of a redundant system is the best way to protect everyone. So there are six principles that form the basis of the safe system approach, and those are death and serious injuries are unacceptable. Humans make mistakes. Humans are vulnerable, meaning that we break when we have crashes. Uh, responsibility is shared. Safety is proactive and redundancy in our system is going to be critical. So making a commitment to zero fatalities means that addressing all aspects of the safety through the following five safe system elements. So together, these create a holistic approach with layers of protection uh, for roadway users. And so these elements are gonna be safe road users, safe vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads, and post-crash care. 
So the Safe Streets and Roads for All program was authorized uh, by Congress for $5 billion in advance appropriations, which means it's about a billion dollars made available over five years. So this is year two. So we have um, at least three more funding rounds left after this one. This program is built on the development of a comprehensive safety action plan, which identifies the biggest safety problems and through that effort creates a list of projects and strategies. The program then funds safety planning and the implementation of those plans. This program enables interventions and um, interconnects uh, with our safe system approach so that multiple interventions to build safety redundancies to protect people, including infrastructure, behavioral, and operational activities. So the notice of funding opportunity is currently open. Um, so if you have not been made aware of that, um, this is uh, very critical information for you to know. Um, it's open um, from now until July 10th. Um, the last day to ask technical questions is June 16th. So after June 16th, um, we won't answer clarifying questions about the NOFO language. Um, but we will be able to answer some administrative questions like, you know, when is the deadline, stuff like that. Um, I'll mention later on in this presentation, but this website um, has lots and lots of resources um, to help applicants, um, in addition to information about webinars and other useful materials. Um, we realize that many communities may not be familiar with the federal grant application process, um, and so we've tried to, um, to provide as much information um, as possible. Um, also, no late applications are going to be accepted, so don't be that person who waits until the last second and then has some type of technical issue and tries to get an exception. Um, you're not going to get one this go around. We had a handful of late applicants last year, uh, and our goal is to have zero late applicants this year. So let's kind of talk more about these SS4A grants. So let's talk about eligible recipients first. So these include metropolitan planning organizations um, or political subdivisions of a state, which is defined um, in our NOFO as a unit of government created by and under the authority of a higher level of government. So that could include cities, towns, counties, special districts, uh, and similar unit, units of local government. Um, also, a transit agency may be eligible as a political subdivision of a state if it was created under state law. So that's one of the nuances with that. Um, also, tribal governments or a combination of any of these. I also want to take a moment to talk about multi-jurisdictional groups. So working together with other eligible recipients is a great strategy for those interested in developing an action plan to help smaller communities that may not have experience with the federal grant process or the staffing capability to manage these types of grants. Um, MPOs might be a natural focus for partnering um, in these regions, but there could be some other ones as well. And note that the state DOTs are not an eligible recipient, um, which is you know, typically different from some of our federal um, grants in the past, um, but they can be great partners to provide technical expertise in the planning and implementation process. Um, there are three types of eligible activities, which will um, fund using two different types of grants. So we have planning and demonstration grants, and we have implementation grants. So those are the two types of grants. And I'm going to talk about more of those um, here right now. So planning and demonstration grants can be used for a variety of activities, including developing or updating an action plan, conducting supplemental planning or completing demonstration activities. And I know a lot of people have some questions about demonstration activities, so um, hold with me for a couple of minutes. Uh, community, communities that do not already have a qualifying action plan should apply for funds to develop an action plan and may include supplemental planning and or demonstration activities in their application. So let's first talk about action plans. There are eight main components to it. Planning uses data and analysis to identify community safety problems. The community also engages the public and other stakeholders in the process-oriented approach. And based on all of that information, a list of projects and strategies are developed and to address the identified safety problems. So when it comes to supplemental planning and demonstration activities, supplemental planning um, updates or it further elaborates on the components of an action plan. It can be updating an existing plan or adding bells and whistles or even taking a deeper dive 
um, based on identified needs of a community. Uh, topical sub-safety plans could be speed management, vulnerable road users, um, accessibility for individuals with disabilities, um, Americans with Disability Act or ADA transition plans, health equity, um, let's see, safety-focused intelligent transportation system implementation, uh, lighting or other relevant safety topics. Uh, there may also be um, a high injury network series of roads that you want to do road safety audits on or an additional data analysis to um, identify contributing factors. You can also further engage communities or assess how different groups such as kids, older adults, or communities of color should be considered uh, in the implementation of projects and strategies. When it comes to demonstration activities, um, one thing to note is that the department anticipates awarding $250 million in funding to demonstration activities alone. Uh, demonstration activities are not new per se, but in the latest NOFO, we have clarified and elevated them based on our experience in the first round of funding. Demonstration activities are temporary in nature, nature and meant to test changes that would advance safety before you go out and spend millions of dollars on projects and different strategies. Demonstration activities tie back to information in your action plan, um, especially the list of projects and strategies that you have identified. So a couple examples, um, and we might go into more detail later on, but um, so these could be quick build strategies, also known as tactical urbanism, that inform permanent projects in the future. For example, say you want to reallocate road space to test out a new separated bike lane. You can use paint and plastic bollards and whatnot to see if that works before you go out and make permanent changes. Uh, and the picture on the bottom left that I'm showing here uh, is an example of what that looks like. You could also use these funds to pilot programs for behavioral or operational activities. So that could be, uh, say for example, you wanna test out a new education campaign um, and messaging at a kind of a small scale before you go out and do a much larger campaign. So this would be like focus groups and whatnot before you go out um, and expand the resources doing a bigger campaign. You can also do pilot programs that use technology to enhance safety benefits. Um, these need to be technologies that are not already adopted by your community. So if you're already doing something on a wide scale, uh, you can't claim that one of these demonstration activities is to, um, you know, see if these are going to work because you're already doing that on a larger scale. Um, but for a small scale, it could be something like uh, testing out variable speed limits um, on one of your major arterials just to see how well it works um, and collect data to go out and inform your plan going forward. Um, lastly, engineering studies that further um, the safety applications of the MUTCD or the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Uh, an example might be testing out high visibility crosswalk markings before um, spending the resources to go out uh, and uh, put them out um, all over your network. Uh, so one question that you might have is, is what's the difference between implementing projects and strategies in doing um, demonstration activities. So demonstration activities, again, are meant to be temporary and smaller scale, and um, they, uh, uh, you must go out and assess their benefits. So um, that assessment is going to inform your action plan and your list of projects and strategies in that plan and possibly the prioritization of those projects and strategies. When it comes to implementing projects and strategies, um, those can be permanent construction and long-term solutions, and they're on your action plans to-do list already. So if we look at what we've already awarded, um, we, uh, in the first round, we had over 500 communities receive funds. Um, action plan grant awards um, are, you know, our hope is that this is going to improve communities and their roadway safety planning uh, and over half, in, in, in touch over the half of the United States population. We had 160 million people um, that will be impacted, um, comprising of communities that had about 14,000 roadway fatalities per year. Um, and that's just one year of funding so far. Um, we're helping communities that represent the United States uh, in its diversity. So we've had small communities with a few hundred people in rural America to large metropolitan regions with millions of people that received uh, grant awards. Uh, we've touched 49 states and Puerto Rico, and over half of the awards um, to communities in the first round uh, were considered to be in rural areas. 
Um, if you want to see who received awards, uh, we have an interactive map uh, like the example you see here on this slide. Um, there are also, um, you can kind of zoom in and zoom out and maybe see if some of your neighbors or somebody got some. It's also worth noting that a little over $8 million of the $1 billion um, were awarded in the last round, uh, which means that we did not award um, all of the funds that were made available. Um, this is due to that 40% um, set aside for action planning activities, um, which was um, undersubscribed. Um, and then what happens was that resulted in um, some rollover funds going into this next round of about um, $177 million. So which means there's about $577 million available for um, some of our action plan activities um, in fiscal year 23, um, which is the current uh, NOFO that's available now. Um, also, I just kind of want to mention that uh, in the first round, uh, for those of, you, those of you who might have gone after an implementation grant and didn't get it, um, we had almost $3 billion uh, requested for implementation funds, and we only had about 580 to $590 million available uh, because of that set aside for um, the um, action plan grants. So a um, couple of examples real quick. So this right here is an example um, from the city of Mount Dora. Not sure if uh, they're on right now. So this was an action plan grant that was awarded uh, in the amount of $160,000 uh, for their comprehensive safety action plan. Um, they uh, have a population of about 16,000 people. Um, and they also had 67 traffic fatalities from 2016 to 2020. And, uh, um, and in this plan, they have 39% underserved population. So this right here is a good example of um, an action plan that was awarded in the last round. Um, for last round, when it comes to implementation grants, um, a large part of the program uh, was focused on that. Um, again, so about you know 60% or so. And applicants who have an existing plan or plans that align with the comprehensive safety action plan process can apply for implementation grants. Um, these could be Vision Zero plans or local road safety plans. It just kind of depends on whether or not you can satisfy those requirements that are listed in the NOFO, but I would ask you and encourage you to take a look at that. Um, implementation grants must be used to fund projects and strategies identified in an action plan. This could be pretty apparent to an applicant because they've already been identified as a solution uh, to a pressing safety need in your community. So projects and strategies can be varied and can be either infrastructure, behavioral in nature, or even operational in nature. Implementation grants may also fund associated planning and design activities to implement a project, so like NEEP review or construction design work. And they can also um, be used for supplemental planning and demonstration activities. So applicants can bundle the, um, activities together so that the application can include one or more projects um, in one location. Um, however, your application needs to make it clear how each activity addresses a specific safety concern. Um, we're also encouraging um, demonstration activities in uh, implementation grants, which I talked about previously. So when you go to fill out your implementation um, grant application, uh, I think there is a button that you can click um, that says that you're also applying for um, supplemental planning and demonstration activities. Um, this kind of consolidates your application um, and it also can help you um, uh, it be competitive. Um, so, so a couple of examples from last round's um, funding uh, to kind of put all this into context. So Woodamore, California got about $2.2 million for um, implementation of adding bicycle lanes, uh, improving sidewalks and installing three roundabouts along a corridor. Um, if you look at here between December 14 and 19, they had a total of 653 collisions um, that occurred within those um, city limits. So they had an action plan and now they're gonna go out and um, um, install some of these different uh, treatments uh, with the hopes of reducing those numbers. McKenzie County in North Dakota, um, which has the highest number of fatalities per county in all of North Dakota um, and also is a rural um, locality. Um, they are awarded uh, about $2.8 million um, to do a systemic safety improvements 
um, which uh, is pretty incredible. So they're going to be um, looking at um, uh, installing pavement markings, signing improvements, shoulder and center line, rumble strips, street lights, and a separated uh, bike and pedestrian path um, on their network. And then last, we also have an example from the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Um, and they were awarded about $7.5 million uh, to improve uh, the safety of trail crossings. Um, if any of you have ever been in that area, it's a um, very heavily traveled um, network. Um, and so this right here is just another good example of um, what they uh, requested uh, and how these funds are going to help them meet their goals going forward. So for those of you who maybe went after uh, funds in the first round and are considering going after in the second round, you're trying to figure out what's the differences between the two, hopefully these next couple of slides will help you uh, kind of distinguish um, those differences. So the NOFO um, will be posted on grants.gov. Again, it's grants.gov, but the application process is now going to go through valid eval. Um, and those uh, links are also on our website. So this is going to be for, hopefully provide a clearer and more standardized structure um, for the application materials. So planning and demonstration grants um, uh, is now the former action plan grant from the fiscal year 2022 um, NOFO, and it's set up to better reflect the eligible activities that applicants can include in their application. Um, we updated the definition of an underserved community to be consistent with the Office of Management and Budget, or OMB, um, and DOT's definitions of a disadvantaged community designations. Um, and those could be any tribal land, any territory um, or possession of the United States, or U.S. Census tracts identified in some of these tools. We have the U.S. DOT Equitable Transportation Community Explorer tool. Um, any subsequent iteration of that tool that's released during the NOFO period, um, or lastly, the climate and economic justice screening tool. And so um, if you were to download this presentation today, um, you can go and just do a quick Google search of these different tools, and it's pretty easy to find them. And lastly, DOT expects to announce um, the grant recipients. We're going to do two different announcements. Um, one, we're anticipating in October of 2023. Um, for an initial set of planning and demonstration grant awards. And then uh, again in December of 23 for implementation grants um, and any remaining planning and demonstration grants. And so the any remaining portion is due to the folks who apply for implementation grants and click that button saying that they're also going after uh, planning and demonstration grants. Um, we've also clarified activities um, with a new focus on demonstration activities. So if you go to the NOFO and look at sections A and C, that's better prescribed. Um, applicants um, are encouraged to include supplemental planning and demonstration activities along with their application to create or revise an existing comprehensive safety action plan. Um, applicants seeking funding for supplemental planning and demonstration activities no longer have to have a completed comprehensive safety action plan prior to submitting an application if they're applying for both creating or advising a comprehensive safety action plan and supplemental planning and demonstration activities. Um, and that's kind of better spelled out in um, section C of the NOFO. Um, an applicant must be uh, in the process of completing or conforming um, comprehensive safety action plan to apply for only supplemental planning and demonstration activities. So if you're, if you're, if you're already in the, that process, uh, then you can apply for just the supplemental planning uh, and demonstration activities. Um, the expected minimum and maximum award ranges uh, have been updated to $100,000 to $10 million, um, which hopefully kind of gives us um, some uh, better uniformity. Uh, we also have flexibility for a longer grant period of performance under certain circumstances that are outlined in section B4. Uh, we've revised the selection criteria for um, the additional safety considerations narrative, uh, which is now expected to be one to two pages. Um, so we got some different um, feedback on that after the, uh, the first round. So hopefully um, most of that stuff uh, makes sense for those of you who are um, actively filling out your applications. 
Now, when it comes to the implementation grants, uh, the expected minimum and maximum award ranges have been updated to be 2.5 million to 25 million. Uh, a fifth selection criteria, um, this is that button that I've essentially been talking about, um, is going to be called supplemental planning and demonstration activities was added to the implementation grant applications. Um, and again, I would encourage you to, um, if you're applying for implementation plans, to also do that fifth criteria asking for supplemental planning and demonstration activities. Uh, implementation grant applicants are encouraged um, uh, to do that. Um, again, it's not going to um, really count against you uh, per se for um, the implementation portion. So there might be, if you click that button, I think there's a question that says, would you be willing to only get your supplemental planning and demonstration activities if your um, implementation grant is not awarded? And what that does is that allows you to consolidate your application uh, and not have redundant applications that are put in uh, and possibly um, inadvertently having one of those um, uh, thrown out um, as a redundant application. And let's see, um, the DOT expects to make um, partial awards again for these different demonstration activities um, where your implementation um, grant is unsuccessful. And then also the list includes additional considerations for award selection in section E um, that has been expanded to include project readiness, um, which was included in the 2022 NOFO uh, percentage of funds to underserved uh, communities. That's uh, kind of a carryover from the first round. Um, projects located in rural areas. So I know this is uh, um, uh, very uh, important to all of you listening today. So this is a new criteria in 2023. So we're definitely trying to um, uh, have uh, a greater um, uh, geographical, um, um, uh, what's the word, just uh, uh, award designation for these rural environments. Um, we're selecting uh, to support diversity amongst um, the uh, award recipients, which is new in 2023. And then um, also new in 2023 is federal funding request um, under $10 million. Um, so a couple of uh, friendly advice or reminders. So the SS4A program will consider one applicant uh, or application per applicant uh, and applicants may only apply for one type of grant. So again, if you're gonna go, um, if you wanna have some of those action plan activities, but also are going after an implementation grant, I would advise you to go after the implementation grant and uh, go with that fifth selection criteria um, to try to get some, um, supplemental planning and demonstration funds um, under that one application. Um, to apply for an implementation grant, you have to already have an existing action plan that meets NOFO requirements. Um, applicants are responsible for using the self-certification eligibility worksheet that's on our website to determine um, that they meet the NOFO requirements um, when you apply for your implementation grant. And then multiple planning and demonstration grant applications that cover the same geographic area. Um, those are going to be flagged um, as potentially uh, duplicative. And then we'll have to look at those to see um, uh, if uh, one of those has to be thrown out. And then lastly, DOT encourages um, including supplemental planning and demonstration projects um, and all of your applications. Again, there's going to be $250 million um, set aside for some of those activities. Um, the last thing is going to be a couple of resources, and then we'll um, try to take some questions if we have time. So uh, if you have not been aware, there have been some SS4A webinars. Um, these are the dates that they uh, um, were uh, live, So, and this is the different topic areas. Um, all of these have been recorded, so you can go back and watch them. So if you were to go to this um, transportation.gov slash grants slash SS4A webinars, um, all of that information will be there for you to go back and, and learn more about each one of these individual grants. Um, also new for this round, we started doing office hours. Um, I think we've already had four of those uh, to date uh, and there are two more um, that are planned. And so the next two are June 2nd and June 6th. Um, and you can kind of tell that uh, these are gonna be specifically for um, asking questions on the grant application process itself. So like, how do I go in there and do 
or fill out this one part of the form, that's what this is for. Um, these have also been recorded, so you can go back uh, and see what some of uh, um, your counterparts might have asked uh, during these sessions. Um, and so all that's on that same um, page, which I see that Jamie has put into the chat pod. Um, lastly, um, we have a whole lot of application aids um, that have been updated from the first round till now. Um, and here's a couple of different screenshots of what those look like. Um, again, these are um, these are really, really great. Um, they kind of help um, walk you through the process um, and we try to simplify it as much as possible. Um, I know, especially for you folks, you've never gone after federal funding. This can be um, extremely intimidating process, but um, hopefully we've made it such that um, it is pretty easy to follow um, and hopefully uh, you're successful in your application. So this right here is our overall um, SS4A website. Um, everything that I've talked about today is made available upon that website. We have different PowerPoint presentations, different webinar recordings, um, the guides. We have information on um, the previous grants that have been awarded in case you're wondering um, what those people um, put in for. Um, so it's an extremely um, uh, uh, well put together website in my uh, personal opinion. So in closing, um, you know, this program in combination with that NRSS um, and the call to action that we've talked about previously, um, you know, we put together, um, you know, a pretty powerful um, set of funds to hopefully combat uh, roadway uh, fatalities. So we've got about four more years and at least $4.19 billion in funding to continue to invest in our communities. And so now is the time to get your community involved in developing a comprehensive safety action plan uh, and putting that plan into action. So with that, um, I guess I will relinquish control to uh, Dana and or Jamie. And if you guys have any questions, I'll do my best to answer what I can today. Perfect. Thank you so much, Elliot. And so for everyone listening in, if you do have questions for Elliot, please go ahead and put those in the question pod at this time and we'll ask him some of those. Again, there will be two more time periods for questions um, after we hear from our next two speakers as well. Elliot, the um, question that we have that came in so far is, is there a match for the action plan grant? Uh, yes, everything is a 20 percent uh, local match and we do have some good guides on our website that talk about you know what that match can be comprised of and what that looks like and some different examples that you can go uh, and figure that out. And then the next question is is this a reimbursement program? Now, the, that part of it, I'll be honest, uh, I know that the applicants are going to be putting in requests through um, our Delphi system, and, I, and I'm almost positive that it's going to be considered reimbursement as opposed to uh, advanced payment. But I think also from the match standpoint, um, that might be a little bit different. But if you go onto our, we have a, a frequently asked questions uh, tab on our website that kind of better answers um, the reimbur reimbursement component of the uh, the program itself. Um, and there is a little bit more information for everyone on page 12 of the NOFO about the cost sharing, um, which includes the match, but also talking about the reimbursement as well. And then the next question for you is, it appears we can't apply for two or more grants, but must we start with a, um, a plan or an action plan? So it, it appears, say, say that one time, it appears you cannot apply for two or more grants? Correct. Um, so you can't apply for, for two or more, uh, but must you start with a, a plan or an action plan? So you can, if you, not necessarily, so if you already have an action plan, then you can apply for implementation funds that um, would be implementing parts of that action plan that you are self-certifying meets the requirements of uh, the NOFO. If you do not have an action plan in place and you would like to go after and start building an action plan, that's when you would put in for that planning and demonstration grants. 
um, application on the front end. So you can't do an implementation grant unless you have an action plan, but you don't have to have an existing action plan to go and request funds to start building one. And then the next question we have for you is, are residential streets eligible? Um, I think you had to go back and see who is requesting under the eligible entities. Um, if that residential street is up under the jurisdiction of one of those um, eligible entities that falls under um, that definition in the NOFO. So it really, it really varies state by state on how those um, are um, um, being handled. For example, I live in the city of Richmond, Virginia, uh, and our residential street that I live on now is under the locality of the city's jurisdiction. So um, if it's under like a private entity is owning that, um, I'm probably going to go on a limb and say it's probably not going to work, but it just depends on um, the government structure that's um, uh, developing and maintaining that roadway. And then it looks like one more question came in for you, and this one's a little bit longer. It says, please clarify, you said state DOTs are not eligible. We're in a rural area that a state highway is the most heavily used road. There have been two previous studies that recommended roundabouts due to safety concerns. Would planning for roundabouts on a state road be eligible? Um, that's a good question. I think, um, again, it, I think the... Uh, that would be one that's better submitted to that um, SS4A uh, listserv so that we can look at the nuances of it, if you can better describe that, because I don't want to give a blanket answer. But um, that when we say that states are not eligible, typically states have been like either a, like a pass-through type function where we would give money to the DOTs and then the locals apply to the DOT to get money. Um, this is a different program where the money goes directly to the locals themselves and the states are not eligible to do that. Um, if you're applying for a, um, let's say, a, uh, an action plan grant where you're looking at uh, an entire network in your region and your region also includes those state roads, um, I, I think it would be more than appropriate to put in that action plan that you're developing that this is a high injury network and we need to put some roundabouts here. Um, but when it comes to getting the funds to implement um, that project, it would depend on um, who those funds are going to and who's administering that project. So if it's going to be a state-run project, um, again, I, I think it just kind of depends on the detail. So great question, and I would encourage you to put that question in ss4a.dot.gov, and we can look at the uh, um, the nuances of it and get you a better answer. And then one more question did come in, or sorry, two more questions came in while we were doing that. The next one is also a little bit more nuanced as well says, if a local MPO is pursuing funds to complete a CSAP focused on safety on school routes, would an application from a participating MPO county focused on rural road safety be considered duplicative? Um, and any suggestions as to how such a scenario would not be considered duplicative within a region? Yeah, that's a tough one. I think I'd have to look at that one. Uh, closer on. So if you submit that one to, or, or maybe let me read that one again, why um, our next presenters is up, maybe we can come back to that one. Of course, I'll send that one to you um, privately so you can read it in more time. Okay. Um, and then the next question after that is, can a local government apply for a grant on a state highway? Yeah, that's similar to the other one. I, I think it just depends on the, the nuances of who's going to be administering the project and who has jurisdiction and how all that's going to work out. Um, so these are the type of questions that we want to have to come in before June 16th so that we can get you set up appropriately. So when you do your applications, it's not um, accidentally um, thrown out um, because of the way that the reviewers read the application. So. Okay, and at this time, that's all the questions. So I think we'll go ahead and move along to our next presenter. I'll send you that other question so you can read it in a little bit more detail. All right, um, thanks. And we'll circle back to more questions after we hear from Adam. So Adam is next. He is with Kentucky Local Technical Assistance Program. He currently serves as the local government outreach engineer with the technology transfer program at the University of Kentucky where he provides on-call engineering assistance to local governments. 
Adam is an expert in traffic safety and the operational and safety impacts of geometric design. He uses this expertise to assist agencies in developing safety plans and identifying innovative treatments to safety and operational needs. Adam is a registered professional engineer in Kentucky, and he's going to talk to us about what they did um, for the first round of SS for A. So, Adam? And Adam, we can see your slides moving, but we cannot hear you. Me. Perfect. Now we can hear you. Go ahead. Jamie, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so again, thank you all and uh, welcome uh, from Kentucky. What I'd like to share with you today is how uh, we approached uh, the uh, Safe Streets and Roads for All with the first round of funding, and hopefully it may spur some ideas for how you can uh, look at some of your smaller communities as well. Uh, so today, before we get started into our approach, I kind of wanted to give you a little bit of background on Kentucky and then some of our technical assistance activities that we have here. Um, we'll talk about what we envision that impact of safe, safe streets and roads for all on the rural communities, how we went about approaching that, and then some of our lessons learned that we're taking forward as we move for uh, round two and trying to get some of our other communities uh, involved. To give you just a real brief uh, overview of Kentucky, uh, we've got 120 counties. Uh, we have about 80,000 miles of roadway, and about a third of that is state maintained, and uh, two thirds is locally maintained, either by a city or a county. Uh, when you look at all of those counties and, and all that mileage of roadway, we've got about nine county engineers. The majority of our rural communities and rural counties. Uh, the road department is uh, managed by a road supervisor, so not a uh, not necessarily a uh, county engineer or a registered civil engineer. And uh, so they are really good at maintaining the roadways. Uh, some of the things that we've got, especially in terms of safety, uh, they may not have that much exposure to. And so when we start to look at grant programs such as this, uh, we can have some challenges in serving all of the counties within uh, Kentucky. And also just wanted to point out, you know, if you look, we've got 52,000 miles of local roadways, but only about 15% of fatal crashes occur on our local roadways, because these are typically um, lower speed or uh, it's, it's one of those roads that it may be 55 miles an hour, but they're so windy uh, and narrow that it's best to drive slow on. So we don't have the high number of fatalities on those, uh, but what that means then is those fatalities are kind of spread throughout that whole system. So trying to track those down and figure out how we uh, can address 15% of our crashes across 50,000 miles of roadway presents kind of a unique challenge uh, for us. And that's essentially what we do at the uh, local technical assistance program. Uh, so we work with each of the local communities, primarily counties and cities, uh, to transfer best practices from our state DOT or from our research areas and implement those on our local road system. So you kind of see this sign here. And you know, this is pretty standard for what we can see uh, on a lot of roadways. Uh, you know, not necessarily uh, to MUTCD, MUTCD standard. Uh, WARN hasn't been maintained uh, you know, in many years. And uh, that's if you've got a sign at all. So what we really try to do is look at what are these kind of um, you know, low hanging fruit that we can come in and say, if we don't have curve signing, we can improve uh, curve signing on that roadway, or we can update uh, those signs to meet the standards so we can provide a consistent look and feel throughout our roadways. Uh, give you a bit of history, uh, the way that our technical assistance has typically gone is we have a safety circuit rider program and I'm the, the safety circuit rider. Uh, Kentucky was one of the first states uh, with the safety circuit rider program starting in 2005. 
Uh, we were one of the original FHWA pilot uh, states. And through this program, we have free technical assistance for anybody that has questions, uh, you know, just says, how, what should I do with this situation? But we also address six focus counties a year. Uh, and so in these focus counties, uh, we work with the county officials to identify some of those uh, higher level roadways where we've got more traffic and we may see more crashes. Uh, and then we look to implement low cost safety improvements on those. When the program first started, uh, we didn't really, we went out, we worked with the counties, we provided some free training and we conduct a road safety audit. And then we left and we kind of said it was up to the counties to uh, implement those solutions. So all we were providing to our local roadways was that technical assistance. Um, over the years, we started to say, you know what, we really need to uh, invest more in these counties or these focus counties. And so now we provide about $5,000 worth of signing improvements for each of those focus counties. Uh, and this is all funded through uh, the KYTC or the Transportation Cabinet Highway Safety Improvement Program. Uh, but that, op that uh, evens out to about $200,000 per year that was invested into these local roadways. Uh, back in 2019, uh, we participated in another pilot program looking at local road safety plans. And so this essentially takes the approach that we look at on just those two uh, high order roadways in the county and started to, let's do a crash analysis, uh, road safety uh, assessment or road safety audits on all of the roads and then try and do this with the data driven process. Uh, as we've worked through this, these projects are also eligible for HSIP funding. And so we got to about a million dollars a year um, right now of HSIP funding that's available to these locals that have conducted a local road safety plan um, and uh, can then implement those projects. So that's kind of how our history has been. Uh, if you look at it, we provide technical assistance for those local road safety plans as well. And uh, we handle about three to five counties per year. So, uh, you know, the total number of roadways uh, in total investment, you know, we started with say 12 roads a year. Uh, now we've got up to a million dollars of funding, but we've got 120 counties and 50,000 miles of roadways. So even that larger investment doesn't go as far as we'd like it to. And so that's why when we look at safe streets and roads for all, we were really excited that this was a significant opportunity. Just the level of investment, as well as that funding going directly to the locals, we saw this as um, a really good opportunity to not only take those primary roadways or those major local roadways and increase those or raise those up, but the lower order roadways. And so, you know, we always say we've been raising the ceiling and this really gives us that opportunity to raise the floor for all of our roadways and kind of get that minimum standard of uh, what we expect on our local roadways uh, increase just because of the level of funding that uh, is associated with. So we're really excited uh, when we saw this and as an LTAP, you know, we really started trying to spread the word and had a lot of resistance uh, initially on whether or not it was um, beneficial or worthwhile to pursue uh, safe streets and roads for all. So uh, some of the challenges that we faced is if you look at our counties, uh, you know, this map shows where our MPOs are. 16 of our 120 counties are covered by an MPO. Uh, 131 of our 431 cities are, the cities are covered by an MPO. And it's really our MPOs that had the experience that had the staffing that had the um, you know the time to start pursuing some of these safe streets and roads for all uh, grants during the initial round. Uh, so our rural cities, uh, our smaller uh, counties, really were at a disadvantage. Um, a lot of this was really just too big for one organization. They didn't necessarily have the um, the administration, the grant writing expertise. Uh, they didn't have the technical ability to carry out a lot of these things. And so that's why we, we so we've got a, a problem here. And then also, if you just look at the safe streets and risk for all selection criteria is we've got small counties and 
if you look at the number of crashes, the number of injuries and fatalities in an in individual county, it doesn't necessarily bubble up to the top to where you say this is a problem. And so that's when we started to say, can we start to form this a consortium uh, that was kind of pointed out in the original NOFO, uh, but really trying to figure out how exactly do we uh, put together that consortium for all of our counties. And one of the biggest challenges we had with that is who's that leader uh, for those. I also want to mention in terms of challenges is, uh, and I know there's been some discussion on um, the match and a 20% match for some of our smaller counties who don't have that much disposable income. Uh, that was really a, uh, that was kind of a limiting factor. And so we started to look for ways and can we get efficiencies if we move towards a consortium that we can start to lower those uh, match requirements uh, as well. So the approach that we came up with is uh, we use what's uh, called a area development district. Uh, those are central rural planning organizations. And uh, these ads, uh, as they're known here, they were established by uh, state legislature. So that was kind of the first hurdle uh, that we had to overcome. As we said, we've got these planning organizations. Are they eligible to lead the individual uh, or lead this consortium? Uh, we had a lot of resistance from the uh, individual counties because they didn't want to, you know, you didn't want to have a county being the leader. They didn't want to be stuck with either the grant administration or be on the hook for that 20%. So trying to work out uh, who's responsible for those match requirements really uh, it kind of added a wrinkle into uh, how we set up this consortium. Luckily, we worked with um, USDOT and got an answer that our, our ads would be eligible recipients. And so they were uh, the champion. They were the leader and the actual uh, applicant for the grant. The technical assistance uh, for the grant writing, as well as any of the information was provided by uh, the LTAP. And so we do a lot of work with um, crash data, crash data analysis, and we're able to support those applications uh, for each of the ads as they were going forward. Uh, when we move into that safety plan and actually executing it, uh, then we're going to be relying on the local agencies for data collection, but then also really to kind of promote uh, what their needs are on the local level so that we can incorporate that into the plan. So uh, right now, um, those that were awarded, and we'll talk about that in a second, they're going through the agreement process. Um, and so the plan is, is to create a safety action plan for all roadways within that area development district within the edge. Um, and then also really focusing on systemic improvements. Um, we know that we can very quickly identify some large uh, big budget improvements, but what we're really looking forward to is how do we uh, affect all of these roadways? So what are those low cost measures that we can put across all of the roadways in the area uh, and really focus on decreasing safety because these fatal crashes in these rural areas are really kind of spread out uh, and we don't have a high crash hotspot that we can focus on. So that was our plan kind of going forward. And some of the benefits that we envisioned and we're really happy to see is kind of coming to fruition is just it kind of gives us a streamlined approach. Um, when we, we had multiple ads, so we had about 10 ads that um, were applying at one time, uh, but we all worked together as a team. And so once we kind of figured out what we needed to do, it was very easy to dupl duplicate that process uh, for the remaining nine ads. You know, so uh, we also shared a lot of information uh, between uh, the different consortiums or the different ads. Uh, and a lot of times we would have one ad say, I've got this problem, how do we address it? And then somebody else might already have that solution. And so being able to kind of work together throughout all those applicants really helped us um, get an overall better product uh, and take some of the strain off so that we didn't have each individual applicant uh, in consortium struggling through trying to reinvent that wheel as we went, went on. Uh, we think once we get into the plan too, we're gonna be able to get much more consistent kind of a comprehensive approach within the regions. Uh, if you look at the topography within each of the area development districts, it's very similar. If you look at 
uh, the soil types, the row types, very similar across that region. And so when we look at these systemic measures, you know, we may, we're going to be looking at very similar improvements uh, throughout multiple counties. And so that's going to allow us to kind of streamline our approach. And then we can also start looking at project bundling when we get into that implementation phase to where if we've got multiple counties that we need to put it in one type of improvement, we can do that over a multi-county area and then still have that led uh, by our area development district. So uh, like I said, we've already started to see a lot of these benefits of one kind of working together as a large group, but then through the consortiums as well uh, with this information sharing, going through the uh, application process. And then easy, even as we're getting our agreements in place, everybody has similar issues and has uh, similar challenges and being able to share those and then kind of brainstorm together on how is the best way to approach this makes it sure that everybody's gonna have a better product in the end. Uh, wanted to share a couple of resources that we've got as well uh, that we've put together at the LTAP. And this is something that kind of feeds directly into uh, what we can uh, kind of give to those counties and the, the consortiums as they're pursuing these plans. So uh, we have in recent years, uh, before we even started, we knew that this um, grant was out there started just gathering and summarizing some uh, crash data. So you can see we've got interactive crash maps that we make available to each county. And then we put together some crash summary sheets. Uh, we call these um, our tap it sheets. So it's kind of common things that most people look at. So we just look at general trends in the crash data. We can compare it to uh, each county by all other counties in the state or all other counties in the region. So we can start to see what are the crash types, what are the uh, different factors that might be increasing the injury and fatal risk on certain roadways by comparing that to others. And so we've already got this kind of pre-canned. Um, that data is available. And so it makes it really easy when we start looking at trying to address a wide range of uh, counties, cities, uh, by having these processes figured out. So it allows us to, you know, help and assist you know, about 80% of our state who receive these awards, we can run through this crash analysis relatively quickly because we're not trying to, again, reinvent that wheel uh, individually uh, within each county in our state. Um, some of the other things that we do is we've started to develop what we're calling our tappet sheet. And these are basically answers to common problems. You know, we've been doing our, uh, We've been the LTAP for a number of years. We've been running our safety circuit rider program for about 20 now. And each community that we go into, we see the same issues over and over again. Um, we have somebody who might call from the eastern part of the state and say, you know, I've got a horizontal uh, curve. We need to put up some signing. What's the best way to go about that? And then the next day we may get a call. Somebody says, you know, we've got a curve over in the western part of the state. So we started to put together some documentation that says, you know, this is how you can do it. And it addresses in one to two pages, 90% of the, the questions that we have on horizontal curvature. So we're essentially trying to, you know, bring and reduce the MUTCD guidance down to its simplest form that we see time and again. Our vision as we go forward with these safety action plans is that as we start to see common issues among each county and among each city, we'll be able to develop this type of guidance um, or, or, you know, kind of a standard mitigation procedure for each of those areas. And then we can share that uh, around the state as well. So that, again, we're kind of gaining that efficiencies by sharing that information and sharing the improvement strategies uh, we've got uh, throughout the region as well as throughout the, the various regions. Um, the overall goal then is to develop a flexible safety action plan. And what we mean by this is that we want to create a safety action plan for that region, but we also want to be able to allow each of the individual members to kind of pull their own plan together from that. So uh, this is an example we put together for the Northern Kentucky ad, which is just outside of Cincinnati. But what we'll do is, um, you know, we'll have our tappet sheets. So we might have standard improvements. 
that are applicable in that area for our urban and rural roadways. We will have, you know, obviously the horizontal curb signing, maybe some guardrail treatments, whatever those types of issues that we see over and over again in each of the counties, we'll be able to pull those, that information together. Uh, we'll be able to have both a region-wide crash summary, but then also uh, distill that down into individual county and city uh, crash summaries. And then we'll have prioritized lists again for the region, but then also have prioritized uh, improvement listings for each of the counties within that area. So that's gonna make up our safety action plan. But what it also allows us to do is that if we've got one county that says, you know, I wanna have my own plan so I can start focusing on improvements in my area, is that I'll be able to pull from that regional plan and uh, very quickly consolidate and make a, uh, a countywide plan or a citywide plan. So we think in this way, it allows us to address, uh, you know, gain a lot of the benefits that we have by forming this consortium, but at the same time, allowing a really custom and individualized plan for each of the different local agencies uh, that we've got in, um, within that region as well. Uh, I do want to take a minute and, you know, just point out that we have had uh, tremendous support from the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, or state DOT. Uh, they have supported us, uh, our safety circuit rider program and local road safety uh, plan programs that we run with the locals are supported through the HSIP program. And then when we started to look and say, you know, how can we pull uh, these ads together? How can we get the resources that we need to it? Uh, we reached out to KYTC and they've really helped uh, support this by showing the value in it, you know, just saying that this is a good program we need to have. Um, and then as we work through it and we would start to run into issues, uh, you know, step by step, KYTC was there uh, to help us as well. And most notably, we ran into a lot of questions on that uh, local match. Uh, with a 20% local match. And so when we worked with KYTC on the first round, they said if we had a rural county uh, or rural agency that was going after um, the safety action plan grants is that they provided that local match. So the 20% of the local match is coming through state funding uh, through KYTC. And I just don't think that the success that we've had really would have been possible without those. Uh, one other thing that I want to point out is that if you look at the safety action plan requirements and you compare those to our local road safety plan requirements, which we need in order to be eligible for HSIP funding, is it checks all those boxes. And so we're also able, when we talk to our counties and we say, you know, if you are going to pursue safe streets and roads for all, not only are you going to be eligible for uh, safe streets and roads for all implementation funds, you're also gonna be eligible to take those projects to uh, the HSIP funding uh, through KYTC. And so that gives us another layer uh, of funding potential that we can say, you know, this is gonna be a plan that is gonna be put into action. So um, a lot of times I know there was some discouragement with the uh, implementation funds that were released with the Safe Streets and Roads for All. And that's why we're coming back and saying, you know, that's not the only benefit that you can get through um, the safety action plan. And so I, I do want to say, you know, that's one of the things that we've really been pushing as well, because originally uh, some of the first concerns we heard was, you know, what do I do with the plan? You want me to pay, um, you know, a lot of money, spend a lot of time to get a plan. What's that going to do me? And so we've really focused on working with our locals and saying, you know, this is what you can do. You can be eligible uh, for safe streets and roads for all. But then also the other federal grant programs, uh, connecting communities, uh, et cetera, that having plan or projects identified in the safety plan is going to open up a lot of different funding eligibility. Um, eligible for the KYTC funds, as we just talked about. Uh, and one of the other issues that we or opportunities we saw come up is one of our ads. They said, you know, we don't think we're we're not counting on getting. Uh, grant funding through this. 
but we think this is just going to help us identify better projects by going through that data-driven process by really examining our roadways and trying to understand what uh, is going on on our roads and trying to understand the best strategies to uh, address those, it's going to get us better projects, whether that's uh, submitted for state funding through uh, our uh, state prioritization process or identifying that within uh, capital funds through uh, our, our maintenance and road departments. Uh, uh, some of our regions were saying, this is really where we think we're going to get the benefit of it. And one of the other things that I think, and we, we continually stress, is a lot of the things that you identify in a local road safety plan, uh, especially our low cost systemic measures, these don't necessarily require additional funding. It's what we do day in and day out. And it might be vegetation clearing, you know, uh, ditching, making sure that our pavements have proper friction. Those are all things that we do regularly, but by going through this planning activity and getting a plan, a prioritized plan, identifying our worst roadways, uh, we've had uh, road departments come back and say, you know, this just helps me do my job better. Because I know at the beginning of the day, I'm not going out where somebody called to complain. I'm going out where the data and where the crashes are, because if I know I go work on vegetation clearing on this roadway, it's going to immediately impact the safety of that road. So uh, just looking at and trying to sell what we can do with that plan. So this is the uh, same map that uh, Elliot had shared earlier, just wanted to highlight Kentucky. Uh, you can see our regions primarily to the west and the north um, were successful. All of the regions that we had uh, applying were successful in uh, securing a grant in the first round. And so we're working with our remaining area districts uh, to submit for round two. I say we, we did, uh, I think, probably one of the best in the country, except for maybe Iowa. And I think they took a similar approach as we did, but just applied for uh, statewide funding. So uh, we did have one implementation award in Louisville, uh, but you can see we had 11 ads submitted with 85 counties, uh, and then we did have some individual city recipients uh, submitting in round one. Uh, just to go over some of the lessons learned, and I'll do this relatively quickly, I don't want to take all the time from um, Kevin. But you know, smaller agencies, they need help. Um, some of the things that we may take for granted in terms of looking at crash data, um, you know, as then you throw in you know, the um, underserved areas. Uh, some of our agencies have GIS expertise, some of them have data management, some of them don't. And so you know we know that they they need that help, and we really were, uh, active and try to reach out to those communities to say, hey, we can help and assist with this. Um, and then the financial component. We started looking at this, you know, we said, you know, if we have 10 counties joined together for 20% on a $200,000 uh, safety action plan, we're looking at about $4,000 per county. And a lot of times that was um, prohibitive for some. And so that's why really the KYTC funding for that uh, was was very beneficial and allowed us to get it done. If not for that, I don't know if we would have had as many agencies participating. Uh, but trying to find those solutions uh, or working with in-kind donations or matches uh, through activities. Uh, I can't stress enough how uh, beneficial it's been to not only share within the counties uh, within a region, but also working with all of the regions kind of going and marching in the same direction, sharing resources, ideas, uh, approaches has really streamlined this uh, so that we're not continually uh, have 12 different people going in 12 different directions trying to come to the same answers. Uh, this goes for you know addressing those common issues. Uh, we find a strategy, a, a safety strategy that works, and we can take that and apply that um, everywhere. Um, in terms of getting communities uh, together, you know, selling the plan is that there, there's a intrinsic value in having that plan and putting it to work. Uh, it doesn't necessarily focus just on what's that implementation funding coming, but we, through our local road safety program, have seen that there is a lot of uh, benefit just from having a plan and using that in our daily activities and not even uh, looking at additional fundings. Um, 
And then, you know, focusing on those low cost systemic improvements so that we get that really high BC ratio. And that's how we're going to be able to get out and address 50,000 miles of roadway. You know, we've been doing 12, 12 roadways a year. Uh, so, you know, maybe get up to 60 miles a year. Uh, we think this is really the opportunity where we can start to get a significant portion of that overall and total mileage system upgraded and addressed uh, within Kentucky. Finally, I just say, you know, get started. Uh, we had a few um, we had a few agencies that were uh, apprehensive. Um, this was new to uh, this was new to USDOT. It was new to uh, us. Uh, we heard a few times, you know, this hasn't been done before. And if you look at the way the grant program is structured with going directly to the locals, you know, none of this has been done before with anybody. So we have been. Uh, kind of putting the airplane together as we have gone, uh, but we've been getting it figured out. Uh, had really good support from uh, our FHWA division, uh, USDOT, and answering those questions. It might take a couple of times making sure we're clear, but uh, you know, getting started and just trying to get it uh, through, and, and we are excited on what is to come. So that I believe is all I've got. Um, here's my contact information, as well as Martha Horseman. Uh, she's our program director and the director of the um, uh, LTAP program here in Kentucky. Uh, so if you have any questions or want to talk more about it, you feel free to reach out to us and I will open it to questions. Thank you, Adam. We have just a few questions for you. The first one is, how long did it take you to get the consortium together, and when did you start relative to when the applications were due? Um, so the first round we actually started, uh, we were at the NACE conference uh, last year, uh, and they said it's, and I think that was in early May, they said that the NOFO is coming out in May. Uh, we started on the plane ride back, trying to figure that out. Um, it took quite a bit of time, uh, because we did not, when we went to the counties, when we went to the uh, regional uh, or the RPOs, they didn't have much interest. I, I think part of that was they didn't, it, we needed to share the vision that we had for uh, the project uh, as well. And so it took quite a few meetings, I want to say five or six meetings with uh, our ads with our uh, state and with the uh, county governments to get them on board. Um, now we're in a position this round where the the ads, the counties have seen what we're doing and they're coming to us. So, um, you know, the biggest thing is just really trying to get out and sell from the beginning uh, what, what the benefit is. Once we got it together, uh, Trying to figure out the structure did take a while. Uh, there was a lot of questions, like as I said, what is the ad an eligible recipient? Could we have gone through the LTAP? So there was quite a few concerns of what that structure was. Uh, and as soon as we figured out uh, that, it went together pretty quickly. Um, but the biggest thing I would say is trying to, you know, sell it and make sure that everybody can see what impact this funding can have and then make sure you get the structure uh, set up quickly, uh, as quickly as you can, and have somebody, somebody needs to step up and say, you know, we'll, we'll be the champion and we'll be uh, the lead applicant on it. Uh, and once that's done, I think it's, it's relatively smooth sailing and the application process is not an onerous one as well. And the other question we have, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer if we need to have Elliot answer it, but could counties in two different states apply as a consortium? My understanding from the first round was that yes, because the application distributed um, what where that funding went between states. And so, and I know we've got some MPOs that crossed borders. Um, and so my, my answer would be yes, but I'll I'll defer to uh, Elliot on that one if, if you'd like to. Sorry, I lost my mute button. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I, I think I would agree with um, with Adam's response on that one as well. It Again, it 
it, it depends on uh, if you're in that same um, geographical region, I think is the, the key there. You can't just have somebody in Tennessee set out to apply with somebody in Montana and think it's going to work out. And then uh, one more question that came in is, are the road supervisors recept receptive to improving rural road standards as well as safety improvements? Uh, our road supervisors uh, are. Uh, at the same time, they um, safety is not their primary focus. Uh, I come from a background of research and you know, trying to work with DOTs and doing research, you come to really quickly understand that your priority isn't necessarily everybody else's priority. And I'd say that that uh, sometimes can, uh, is similar to working with road supervisors and safety improvements because, you know, a lot of times they're just trying to keep everything open and running and making that improvement is difficult. And so we worked a lot with, we've got a fiscal court system here. So our um, county magistrates or uh, similar to a councilman or a judge executives is really where we, uh, focused and then they kind of set that standard for the counties and uh, for the road supervisors as well. Perfect and that's all the questions we had for you now. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now um, you're going to see your screen blip out just real quick as we get this turned over to shared screen, screen with Kevin Elliott. Um, he will be our final presenter, and he's just going to provide some um, additional resources and a few wrap-up points for us. Kevin is the marketing manager for the National Center for Rural Road Safety, where he leads all outreach. His other work includes marketing lead for multiple Federal Highway Administration Office of Safety teams, including the data-driven safety analysis, focus on reducing rural roadway departures, safe transportation for every pedestrian, and the intersections focused approach. He lives in Panama City, Florida with his wife, daughter, and 15 chickens. So Kevin? Okay, you're seeing my home screen and hear me okay? Yep. Okay. And to the folks left on there, I only have a 40 minute presentation. I kid, just kidding. I've been actively editing as the guys as Elliot and Adam were uh, covering items, I was cutting mine down. So I have a few pickup items, just to, I'm sort of the mop up guy here at the end and a, a little review and just some reminders that I'll jump into. The first one is um, there is an additional resource out there, a really good one for local road safety plans. And as you heard Adam say, you hear these terms, safety action plan, local road safety plan and all these different things. And what, what the, DOT is doing is trying their very best to make sure that these things map to each other and are very, very similar so they can they can serve multiple purposes. Like Alan, Adam showed, multiple funding sources, HZIP, as in addition to SS4A. FHWA built a really good do-it-yourself website um, for local road safety plans. And they've updated that recently based on feedback from the first round of SS4A. And they've also gotten, um, just to bring it more in line with what is required for SS4A. It's a great resource. It has template, it has a local road safety plan template there. Recently, like just updated in the last couple of months, there are guides, lots of example plans from others around the country. This thing is chock full of original videos made just for this site. There are tutorials. So you'll see there, if you know Jerry Rochi and Hillary Isobrands from FHWA, they are the sort of the host. They're walking you through this at every step to help you work through. And at every page and at every step, there are examples, there are tools, tutorials, links to other things, lots of good information. So it's not, it, it is a resource page, but it is really well structured and takes you through the steps, step by step. Uh, so recommend you jump there. Some reminders about the, and some things about the uh, planning and, and uh, demo grants. Uh, first of all, as Elliot mentioned, there are carryover funds on this side of the fence. They were over, they had like tons and tons more people on the implementation side last time, but not uh, as much money as they had on the planning and demo side. And they've rolled that money over. They're, they're expecting to award about 100 implementation grants, but they're looking to do $250 million or so 
on this side of the fence. There, there are huge opportunities for rurals to get together, um, like Adam said, get together and go after this money. Use the checklist. Th this was a, a, a an issue that happened sometimes in the last round is that applications were sort of incomplete. They did they had they were missing pieces. So they had that self certification certification eligibility worksheet, and also there are checklists on that resources page. That is the the link right here, the SS4A resources page. Uh, they've really fleshed that out. There are tons of new information on there that wasn't there the last round, and they've done that specifically to respond to feedback they got in the first round. So if you haven't been to those sites that are mentioned throughout this presentation, if you haven't been there in a while, go there and check it out. There's a lot of good stuff. You can also go to the National Center for Rural Road Safety, our website. We have some help pages on there, but ultimately those pages are going to drive you to these pages. And so uh, we really recommend you you do that. But, but the there was a big opportunity last time. It's even bigger this time because there's more money and they have learned and they have tried to sharpen this and focus this on ways that rural communities can access this money. And I thought Adam did a great job of showing you creative ways of getting together and going for it. So some important dates in this, in this mindset, there are gonna be more office hours, more and more um, times for you to come and listen and to learn and to ask questions. There are two coming up, June 2nd and June 6th. The deadline for questions, Q&A, is June 16. Get your questions. There are some super smart questions on this Q, on this webinar. I, please go there and submit those same questions there. So the one, you can get answers directly from uh, USDOT. Also, those are going to be published so other people can, can benefit from your smart questions. And then the application is July 10. Like Elliot said, they will not take it late ones. They, uh, do your very best to get that in on time. And we have a couple of last little things, but I'm going to stop right there. I don't guess you have questions for me because I was reviewing what the other guys mentioned, but I will stop here just for a second, turn it back over to Jamie and let her bring it in for landing. But if there are questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Uh, we do not have any other questions, Kevin. So if you want to go through, we'll just uh, get us closed up here in the last few minutes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We hope that you have learned how to uh, what the requirements are for this round of the Safe Streets and Roads for All uh, Notice of Funding, and that you can identify the differences from the first round, list the lessons learned by Kentucky LTAP, um, and identify resources for developing action plans. We put all those links in the chat pod for you. There also is, I'll remind you, that handout that you can download that also includes all of these links as well. And uh, next slide, please. Just a few updates for you all for saving the date. Our Rural Road Safety Awareness Week will be held this year from July 17th to the 21st. And our topic this uh, year will be speed. There already is some information available on the National Center for Rural Road Safety's website on how to go about asking for a proclamation uh, for that week. There's also the Save the Date graphic that's available already and more will be rolled out in the coming weeks uh, between now and July 17th. Um, there also was a webinar last week which talked a little bit about this theme and the uh, recording for that will be up on the website within the next few days as well. So you can access that if you weren't able to join us last week. And then we hope we'll see you all at the fourth national summit on rural road safety uh, with the theme of resources for rurals, equipping you to save lives. That will be held September 12th through the 14th in Oklahoma City, um, and it will be partnered with uh, NATO's regional transportation conference that they have as well. Um, our basic agenda is up on the website right now, and we hope to be opening registration within the next week or two. So again, watch your emails for that information as well. So thank you all for joining us today. I do want to thank Elliot, Adam, and Kevin. Um, it was a great webinar. I hope you learned a lot. The questions were, were fantastic. Um, and again, if uh, Elliot had, had pointed you towards sending in your question, um, as Ke Kevin said, please do that um, by June 16th to make sure that they can provide answers to those technical questions uh, for everybody. The email again is ss4a at dot.gov. Um, thank you all for joining us today and have a great day.